And may we thank you very much for coming uh, and accepting our invitation to this committee. You would probably know we started our inquiry uh, in the summer last year when suggestions had been made by leader of the Liberal Democratic Party, by the Prime Minister, that uh, perhaps one should look at the way Prime Minister's questions were actually carried on and whether indeed uh, there should be any way that we might improve this. Uh, we are most grateful that uh, you should come today. Uh, it is fairly unusual for a member of the, the other place to actually come to give evidence. We know you've done this once before, uh, but we, uh, I think uh, it is the first time that uh, uh, an ex-Prime Minister uh, or past Prime Minister has come to give evidence to this committee. And uh, we will certainly be delighted to hear what you have to say, realizing uh, your 50 years of service to Parliament, uh, 42 years in the House of Commons, and now eight years in the House of Lords. And uh, if you need to be put at your ease, which I'm sure you don't, much I suggest that in this committee we uh, uh, proceed as a matter of politeness uh, by good manners rather than by uh, aggressive hectoring. We think we get much further with witnesses that way. So could I perhaps begin <coughs> by asking, how do you view the way that Prime Minister's questions have evolved during this last 50 years that you've been associated with Parliament? Well, they've changed very considerably. Uh, when, uh, when I first arrived, the, uh, the normal practice was for the leader of the opposition to ask a question of the Prime Minister on a matter of perhaps of international importance. Uh, when he, for example, uh, when is he going to see President Eisenhower, and uh, will he discuss with him the question of uh, career or something of that sort? It was that kind of question. I don't ever remember the Prime Minister having to answer questions about constituency matters. Or, and of course, in those days, there wasn't a, uh, uh, a tabloid headline or a Today program um, first item. Uh, to which the Prime Minister was supposed to respond at uh, 2.30 on the 3 o'clock on the same day. So the nature of questions has changed very considerably. Um, do you think that um, PM's questions, particularly in view of the TV coverage, has become too much a sort of theatrical, political knockabout, uh, rather than, and perhaps it gives a, a very wrong impression to the public outside, of the way that Parliament works in general? If you hadn't put the question in that rather affirmative way, I wouldn't have dared from another place have agreed with you. But, uh, but as it is, I think que questions of the Prime Minister have deteriorated seriously. I'm told that in America it's regarded as a, a comedy program, and in Holland um, they view it with some contempt. Uh, well, those are expressions of opinion that I wouldn't dare to utter myself, but I don't find myself too far removed. I think that's been put with great tact, if I might suggest, from somebody in the upper house. Uh, might I uh, turn to, to James Hill, who has a question or two, uh, and uh, then to Mr. Tyler. Uh, in your time, of course, uh, Mr. Callaghan, or, or Lord Callaghan. You were going to say Prime Minister. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> um, I understand that when uh, you were answering questions, that you didn't answer for all departments. And uh, then it was changed in uh, Lord, uh, Lady Thatcher's time. Uh, but how important was answering Prime Minister's questions when you were the Prime Minister? Answering questions from my point of view as Prime Minister was not important in the sense of drawing my attention to problems that I didn't know about or hadn't heard of. They were important because of the impact that was left on the House by the way in which the Prime Minister conducted himself. And uh, although uh, I was always extremely apprehensive and nervous, I had to appear in Parliament um, rough, unruffled and calm, where, like the swan, I was paddling like hell underneath. Uh, and and it, um, uh, it, it was not uh, a very helpful exercise as far as I was concerned. I noticed that Professor Norton 
believes that uh, it attracts the Prime Minister's attention to problems that he wouldn't otherwise know about, uh, and um, perhaps uh, makes him take action on them. That was not my experience. Yeah. You weren't, uh, in those days, the, both uh, political parties were not trying to trip you up in any way. It was a, a factual question each time. Whereas now, uh, you've said to, that you don't really like Prime Minister's <laughs> questions now. It, it is turning into, uh, you don't know what the devil they're going to ask. And uh, also it's become a bit of a, 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 a joke shop, I think you said. Or, uh, well, I think uh, um, from the point of view of the Prime Minister, it's become a guessing game. And from the point of view of the press, it's become a ping pong match, who wins and who loses. Uh, and that's the basis of it. Uh, and to be absolutely frank with you, and, and oh, I think every member here is going to hate me after I say this, but on a Thursday afternoon when the Prime Minister met the lobby uh, upstairs quietly, more actual information was elicited then uh, in a courteous atmosphere than was ever, I think, elicited when I answered questions in the House of Commons because you went in in a defensive frame of mind. And I think that has become even more acute in recent, uh, in recent years. Uh, uh, I, I think, the, if I may be bold enough to suggest uh, a remedy, I think it consists of two parts. I fully understand that backbench members want to be able to question the Prime Minister, but I think there should be a certain self-discipline in the kind of questions that are put, uh, both for the sake of um, uh, the, I would almost say the dignity of Parliament, but also, I think, uh, because it undermines the position of a cabinet minister. We have here a system of prime ministerial government. Prime ministerial government implies, uh, of, uh, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't mean prime ministerial government. Uh, what, what, I, what I'm trying to say is we have a system in which the prime minister is first among equals. His job, in my judgment, is to delegate uh, two cabinet colleagues who are equals with him, except in the leadership of the government, the task that they have to do. His job is to keep a general eye on the direction of policy which they are following within the limits of the strategy laid down by the government of the day and by the party of which he is head. Uh, it is not his task uh, to answer for everything that happens in the government. If he does, he is weakening the position of cabinet ministers. And I would regard that as a very bad thing for democracy. And I think it is happening now, when you are visiting upon the prime minister, every particular problem, however small, merely because it catches, perhaps, well, maybe it's important to you because it, it, it is a constituency question. But then cabinet ministers are perfectly, department ministers are perfectly able to answer those, or because it catches the headline. Now, I know television has added to that, but in my view, it's not a good thing for parliament. General um, As a closer observer of uh, proceedings in another place where you've been for eight years, I'm very conscious of the way in which business is conducted in the other place in a courteous manner and the quality of debate, and also particularly in the way in which questions are conducted at the beginning of the afternoon. Do you think, Lord Callaghan, that we have lessons to learn from the other place, and would you like to see perhaps something similar to the way in which we conduct questions in your house? I think in this sense it isn't a question with respect of learning from another place, it's relearning old lessons. I believe question time was far better in the Commons uh, when the open question was not prevalent, when uh, members put down specific questions, uh, specific and substantive questions on particular issues on which they wish to elicit the uh, information or alternatively to criticize the government and that uh, I would but knowing but uh, recognizing that uh, uh, members want a certain amount of topicality uh, naturally I would couple that if you went back to substantive questions or specific questions I would couple that with a more relaxed attitude on the part of the chair for private notice questions so that if there was an important topical question, it could be put down uh, by a backbetcher uh, and, and that there would be a more relaxed attitude towards accepting them to be dealt with not by the prime minister in my judgment, but to be dealt with by the appropriate responsible minister. 
And I think that would improve, in my judgment, if you'll permit me to say so. I know I'm trespassing on all your ground, but you asked me. Uh, that, that would permit, I think, an improvement in the public's perception of the way in which we conduct business. Or charming trespasser, so please go on, <laughs> uh, Mr. Taylor. Tyler. Lord Callaghan, I think we follow precisely what you're saying about the relationship between the Prime Minister and his Cabinet colleagues. But is it not true to say that it would be attempting to put the clock back to make him a lesser figure in the political scene now? And is it really not true that inevitably, if the Prime Minister is going to come before the House of Commons, he will have to be answering on behalf of the whole government? And isn't the Prime Minister's questions at least more effective in one respect than it previously was, in that for a short time each week, the nation is able to see the head of government answer on behalf of the government? Isn't that an inevitable improvement in terms of conveying information, even if the knockabout to which you've so graphically referred, the, the ping-pong match, perhaps a, a medieval jousting match, has a, an element of entertainment? Is it not an inevitable consequence? Well, there's nothing I have suggested which... Um, I meant to, uh, which I meant to, re to reduce the Prime Minister being accountable to, to, to the House of Commons. Of course not. He must be. And whether you have a longer period of question time, it, what I'm, what I'm asking, I think, is that um, specific questions should be put to him, rather than that uh, his office should have to conduct a guessing game uh, on a on, on a Tuesday, on on a Monday and a Tuesday. And from the point of view of the Prime Minister's office, now I know this isn't a, a particular matter, and yet it is of some significance. In the Prime Minister's office, when these open questions go down, um, people say, now, what's this member interested in? What is it that he will want to be asking us about? Um, what is the issues that are likely to come up? What are the topical areas? Uh, if it's, uh, of course, there are some members you can guess and others you can't. I'd never, for example, dare to guess what Mr. Banks would ask about on any particular question. <laughs> but uh, um, but, but, but uh, it, it wastes an awful lot of time. And I would put down, I would like to go forward to, to the substantive question, the specific question on which you want an answer and get an answer to that. Clem Attlee always had a phrase on this, but then you'll regard this as going back. He used to say, I don't believe in hunting other people's hairs. Uh, and, and I think what, what he meant by that was that he preferred one subject and deal with one subject. That's looking at it from the Prime Minister's point of view, of course, not necessarily from the point of view of the back can I ask you, Can I ask a supplementary, Chair? Uh, the, um, Lord Callaghan rather st stimulated Tony Banks here, and I thought I must allow him <laughs> to, to have first, uh, uh, first refusal. Um, Mr. Bear. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I mean, Jeremy, I probably would actually ask you something about animal welfare. I mean, um, and it, but it would always be asked um, with great love and affection. But let me let me just uh, just ask you whether or not your attitude about Prime Minister's question time is perhaps a little different now than it would have been when you were Prime Minister. Because I mean, didn't you enjoy the idea of um, being able to sort of dance around, being able to sort of answer the question. You wouldn't have any great difficulty on something like that. When you go on to a programme like um, the Today programme, they don't give you a list of the questions. Well, I assume they don't give you a list of the questions. Surely, you know, as a professional, skillful politician, um, you can deal with questions whether they've given you notice or, or not. I mean, that's why you're Prime Minister. You flatter me. Yes, I did. <laughs> I was as nervous as hell. Of course, and I, I doubt if any Prime Minister, uh, if he tells the truth or she tells the truth, won't admit the same thing. Of course you're nervous of the House of Commons uh, when uh, you find, when you know facing you are, are, are 300 uh, uh, opponents anxious uh, to, to do you down if they possibly can. Uh, you'd be a fool if you weren't nervous and, and worried about it. You, you always are. And not only 300 on the other side, probably 50 or 100 on the other <laughs> side. <laughs> Uh, yes. I wonder if we could take advantage, Lord Callaghan, of your experience, not just as Prime Minister, but also as Leader of the Opposition, whose role in these matters are very interesting. I think you've seen the uh, letter we've had from Lady Thatcher. I wonder if you'd care to comment particularly on the point number one she makes. I wonder whether there isn't just an element of rose-tinted amnesia here in her mind, uh, a little bit of wisdom after the event. Was it your experience? 
when you faced her across the dispatch box that she was anxious to make sure that all members of the House were getting all the information they needed. Wouldn't it be fairer to say that she was the mistress of the evasive answer, just like perhaps some of her successors? I don't think I want to comment on that. Um, I don't think that uh, uh, I, I ever regarded it as um, my, my desire uh, to um, give all the information I could in a, in a question time which I knew was intended to be hostile. Uh, that, that is re really asking uh, uh, you to be a saint. Uh, one, one enters upon question time in a defensive mode. Now, maybe you think that is the best way in which to do it, but I think from the point of view of, uh, of uh, uh, democracy, I don't regard that as being the, 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 the clash as being necessarily the best thing. Of course, there are differences of opinion, uh, but to make, try and make the Prime Minister guess what it is that you're wanting to ask him in order to trip him up, it does seem to me there are better ways than that. When I was in opposition, of course, I, this is another, may I go on? When I was in opposition, another, <laughs> you've raised this question, um, sent me thinking again. Uh, I decided immediately after the general election of 1979 that I didn't intend to question the Prime Minister on everything. I see no reason why the leader of the opposition should be expected uh, to question the Prime Minister on every occasion on every subject that comes up has been a headline in the Today programme. See, no reason at all for it. So I sat down and I didn't, I didn't get up to ask a question. What was the result? All these new young members, inflamed with victory, all sat and jeered at me. They waved their arms. Come on, get up. You're afraid to speak to the Prime Minister. So that trying to keep the leader of the opposition out of it for a bit um, brought upon my head accusations that I was too timid to get up and question the Prime Minister. So I think he's in or she is in a rather, rather difficult position. Uh, but I do, I would say that uh, as long as you continue it in this way, I don't think you can prevent the leader of the opposition uh, from, I've seen some suggestions to this, you can't prevent the leader of the opposition from asking the number of questions that he thinks is appropriate as long as you conduct it in this way. Uh, but if you get, uh, get into a, a, different, uh, a different area, then I think uh, he would himself, I guess, the leader of the opposition or she would, uh, would be ready to stand back a little more. But at the moment, it's a joust. Uh, and, and you are trying, and, what, and I think by some of your uh, some of your practices, you are encouraging a presidential system in this country. Uh, you are encouraging the newspapers uh, and everybody to look uh, to the two lead leaders of the two parties. They're the only people that matter. Talking about clause four, it's Mr. Blair's clause four, it's nobody else's clause four. This is not good for our kind of system uh, that, that we should be operating in this way. Forgive me being so bold, but I, I know... I, I, no, you are Mr. Andrew Mackay. Callaghan as one looking back some 16 years who from time to time tried to trip you up highly unsuccessfully, if not tried to do you down. I can't recall it being any less controversial and confrontational in those days. It's perhaps become slightly no. more trivial now, and this is the point that you've been trying to make to us. And to that end, when you suggest that we should now have substantive questions, surely two weeks is too long in advance, because they then become very dated. From, from your experience, uh, would you have managed in a couple of days, you and your staff, to have prepared sufficiently for substantive questions oh, rather yes. than two weeks? There was often much more time than that, especially on these open questions, because we mm. didn't know what the subject was. And if it's a substantive issue in which the Prime Minister can, office can go straight to the Cabinet uh, Minister responsible and say, look here, what is the position on this? I want to mm. know. Of course, 48 hours is plenty of time, right. especially as there will only be four or five or six questions reached in that time. That isn't a burden at all. Um, I, I, you're quite right. I mean, it was getting very controversial in my time. I think, if I may say so, that wasn't so much the responsibility of the Prime Minister as of the leader of the opposition. <laughs> uh, but, but because when I first came here, um, it, it was... Uh, there was much more courtesy between the leader of the opposition and the prime minister than developed later. Uh, and and uh, although there was strong criticism, there was not the personal criticism 
uh, that sometimes seems to emerge at the present time. Sorry to sound such an old fogey. I think perhaps it's a lesson we should follow. <laughs> Sir John Hannan. Uh, Lord Callahan, you described um, your uh, feelings about the public perception of the Prime Minister's question time. But the other aspect, of course, is the time which the Prime Minister has to devote to Prime Minister's question time. There are all sorts of um, uh, ideas given about the number of hours spent. Uh, how many hours did you have to spend uh, each week in preparing for Prime Minister's question time? And do you think this is a very important factor to take into account? Yes, on, um, on a Monday, uh, I would have in my box um, uh, a thick wad of, um, of questions and proposed answers with some supplementary information, depending, as I say, on who was asking it or what was known about his interests and that sort of thing. Uh, and one would pick one's way through that. Then on Tuesday morning, of course, I would arrive with a series of questions of my own. Uh, why haven't you covered this? What about that? Have you done such and such? Then uh, a private, uh, one, one a senior private secretary would spend the morning uh, getting further information for me. Incidentally, he would have had to have done that on the Monday or whenever he prepared the papers for me. Then at lunchtime, I would have a solitary lunch, a supply system, a solitary lunch, just going through the latest information, listening to the one o'clock news. You know, I, I, I really don't see, let me put this in brackets, I really don't see why the Prime Minister should be expected uh, to answer uh, and make up his mind a matter of judgment on an issue that appears on the one o'clock news when he answers questions at 3.15. It seems to me that his responsibility is much greater than that, and yet that is what he's expected to do, and he will be accused of not meeting the desires of the House if he doesn't do it. So having done that, I'd have a solitary lunch, listen to the one o'clock news, switch it off, back to my book and see, then at 2.15 or thereabouts, have a meeting with my private secretaries, uh, with my PPS, uh, with my political advisor uh, and whoever else I thought was appropriate uh, and um, then at 3.14 walk into the house as I say unruffled and calm. Sir <laughs> <laughs> John Gosh. Uh, Lord Callaghan, I uh, had a look back at uh, when I first came in this house 20 years ago when, uh, and soon after when you became uh, uh, Prime Minister when the questions were in theory specific or at least more specific than they are now. Uh, but actually, they weren't really very specific. You've got to ask questions like, uh, uh, when the, will the Prime Minister next meet the, the head of the TUC or the CBI, or when will he visit, uh, well, Basildon, I suppose, uh, and uh, to which practically every supplementary uh, certainly uh, w was available. Uh, I think it is actually quite difficult for this committee, which is primarily concerned with the rules as opposed to the self-discipline, uh, which, with which I agree with what you said about that, but with the rules to see how we adjust the, uh, or should adjust the rules to make the questions really specific as opposed to pseudo-specific. I, I, I don't disagree with any of that. I, I suppose there is a small procedural point if you intend to go on with the guessing game, and that is that you don't really make everybody ask the question uh, um, uh, as to what is the Prime Minister's engagement for the day, but you, uh, uh, you, you get straight away on to the specific point that you, you want to put uh, rather than wasting a little time, which he has to get up and say, I refer the honourable member to the question answer I've just given or something. That's, I think, but I mean, that's as far as you can go. If members wish, and I dare say they will, whatever this committee recommends, they'll want to carry on, but we'll see. Um, Charles Hendry, Mr Hendry. Lord Callaghan, you've already indicated your preference for the substantive question over the open question. W which do you think it is easier for the Prime Minister to prepare for? And by easier, I mean which is a better use of his time. And do you not think that there is, in fact, an advantage in twice a week the Prime Minister having to sit down to familiarise him or herself with the key issues of the day and also with every problem in every department and the off chance that they may be raised somewhere in the House? I don't think it's necessary for him to sit down and familiarise himself with every, every uh, major issue at all. If he's got confidence in his ministers, he should let them get on with it. Uh, his job is to be thinking on broader, taking an overview and thinking on broader strategic terms uh, than what uh, specific issue is being raised. Of course, there will be major issues uh, that, that will come up on which he must himself be 
clearly informed of the very last minute, and indeed if that is so, he will often take the chair at cabinet committees himself, or herself, obviously. Uh, but um, generally speaking, I'm, I'm in favour of, uh, that every, every Prime Minister has his own way, but I'm in favour of letting ministers get on with it, uh, and, and not, and not in looking over their shoulders the whole time. If, if they've got problems, they're only too ready to come to you, because especially if they don't know what to do about them, they want to enlist your aid and your support. And I think that is, well, that at any rate would be my way of conducting a government, uh, rather than knowing every single thing that's going on in the government. Because I think if you do that, it's going to take you so much time, you won't be able to take a broad view about the whole work of the government, or indeed the interests of the country as a whole. Are you not very strongly arguing for cabinet government and cabinet responsibility rather than for a presidential system uh, uh, implying that could actually work in uh, the British Constitution? Uh, I have. Uh, we, I think one of the great advantages of the House of Commons is that ministers are <coughs> equals with the Prime Minister. He is the first among them. But it does mean that you have a very strong, uh, a, a, a very strong House of Commons when ministers who perhaps lose their office go to the back benches instead of going off to run some small bank in middle America uh, and are never heard of again. They are there and they are very powerful levers in ensuring that democracy works. To my mind, I think uh, uh, that the system we have is a far preferable system for our purposes and I therefore want to see the position of cabinet ministers maintained and built up. And I think by focusing everything upon the Prime Minister, you are weakening the position of the Cabinet and of Cabinet Government. Mr. Eric Gilsmith. Right, Chairman, could, could I ask you, Lord Callaghan, just following on from that point, as far as I understand, I think it's still available to the Prime Minister of the day to delegate a question to one of his ministerial colleagues. I cannot recall it ever happening uh, in my time since 1987. And I'd like to ask you whether you actually, as Prime Minister, delegated a question from the dispatch box to a colleague and whether it was more prevalent during your period or, or what was it was that sort of procedure dying out at that time it was dying out i i, I did it um, but it used to uh, th then people complained bitterly the prime minister dodging it you see uh, and and so um, uh, one did it less and less uh, so there are arguments both ways here, you see. People naturally wanted to fasten the responsibility on me if they could. On the other hand, taking the view that I did, I wanted to see that ministers answered these, the, the, these, these questions, and I believe that was a better way of conducting government. What's but then, you see, you're always uh, the, the servant of the, of, of the members of the Commons, and you must do what they, the way they, go the way they wish to go. Oh, Mr. Pike, Mr. Tony Banks says he has a small yeah, question. Sorry. I mean, the prime, the prime Minister is not a prisoner of, uh, of Parliament. I mean, the Prime Minister, to an extent of the day, connives with this by attempting answers or anything. When John Major first started, he was saying things like, that's a quite an interesting question, I'd like to think about it. Um, that soon disappeared. What's to stop the Prime Minister to simply um, say, you know, that is a matter for, for others to consider? In fact, being somewhat more dismissive of questions until it gets through to people that the Prime Minister isn't going to be a prisoner at the dispatch uh, box. Two points. The only thing that would stop him would be the raucous laughter of the opposition as he said it. Um, <laughs> but but um, uh, <laughs> I think... Uh, Aside, aside from that, there is every reason why he should take time to answer a question if, he, if he's allowed to do so. But I, you know the atmosphere of the House of Commons as well as I do. Uh, I doubt if you get away with it very long. Mr Peter Pike. Yes, Chairman. Lord Cannon, would you think there would be any advantages in having a series of mini-debates on, say, uh, uh, three specific to topics rather than the question and answer system that we've got at the present time? Uh, Not if you focus them all on the Prime Minister. If there is a mini-debate about a subject, in my view, it ought to be conducted by the Minister responsible. If he's not able to answer it, then he shouldn't be there. Uh, I, I, I think that we've really got to draw... Well, I, I think I, I want to draw this distinction. Um, this is the responsibility of an individual minister. And, and unless you want to put down a vote of censure or re reduce his salary by five pounds, or something, I think that these subjects should go to him, you know. Uh, so I, uh, 
I, I think in the sense that the question I was asked here by Gerald Gillen um, uh, about the House of Lords, they turn into many debates in the sense that you have only four questions in half an hour. Uh, they're quite useful, but I must say by the end of the uh, seven minutes or so that's allocated to a question, it is rather fading out. People tend to be repeating themselves a little, you know, uh, in the kind of short question they can ask. Do you think it's the media that's really focused it on that uh, uh, even more than perhaps the members of the House, that it should be the Prime Minister that's the captain of the ship and therefore uh, the book stops there and has to be responsible for that? Is it a media responsibility? Television made it worse? Or do you think it's the House itself? I think it's a bit of both, really. A bit of both. Um, I think members, obviously, if they get a chance of questioning the Prime Minister in front of the cameras, uh, let's just think how that goes down in the village of Little Nettlestead or somewhere, um, when they see their member talking to the Prime Minister. It's a great temptation, of course, and that is why I doubt whether you'll be able to get much change. Or it's Missenden in my constituency, it goes down quite well because I think the computer has chosen me more often than anybody else to go on the order <laughs> paper for questions to the Prime Minister in this session. Um, I want to ask you a slightly delicate question because my constituents complain about Prime Minister's question time because of the noise and the appearance of what is perhaps a zoo. And you can make some powerful arguments that the camera only concentrates on the main protagonists and fails to pick up what is happening in the rest of the chamber. And in fact, the behaviour between the main protagonists is on the whole fairly well known. <coughs> this is a delicate question because um, it pertains to Madam Speaker now, in this case. Uh, the behaviour of the backbenches is sometimes uh, extremely exuberant. Do you think that Madam Speaker's task in keeping the House in order is more difficult today than it was in your time? And if so, do you think that there is any way in which we could help the chair control um, the chamber, or indeed is that something we would wish to see happen? I don't think it's more difficult, uh, really. It depends on the nature of the issue. Uh, I can think of some issues in my day which aroused intense anger, uh, serious, I suppose is the classic example, when the House had to be uh, uh, suspended on several occasions. I'm going back now, as it were, before the experience, I suppose, of a lot of people here, although St. Peter, the chairman, knows. Um, and, and that was really fierce. And I don't think that the House uh, behaves any very differently from the way it used to behave, except uh, that the public now see it. Uh, before, they didn't, and it was very difficult to convey. Uh, but we've always, I think, gone on in this way. And, of course, if one looks further back, the, uh, the Irish debates and the way in which the Conservative Party treated Asquith and so on, I, it was quite abominable in those days. Indeed, probably worse than it is today. So I, I and I, but it's not for me to comment on Madam Speaker, except that she's an old friend of 40, 50 years stand. No, I'd better say that or I'd give her age away. A long-standing friend. <laughs> I think she is a, 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 an extremely able speaker, and I think she really does, uh, insofar as one can control 630 turbulent people, I think she does extremely well, I must say. So do I. Her relationship, you were balancing her on your knee. That's no, no. Be, I think. <laughs> well, no, no. Well, I won't say. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Tyler. Uh, Lord, Lord Callaghan, it's been suggested to us that one way to, to deal with the problems of the format is actually to have occasional change of format, perhaps to replace one of the uh, weekly sessions with a format rather closer to the select committee format that we have here. And I hope we're demonstrating this afternoon on, on both sides of the dialogue that you actually can elicit a great deal more useful information, if that is the purpose, in this format than you can on the floor of the House. Do you think that a Prime Minister would be prepared to su subject himself or herself to that format in the interests of, occasionally at least, providing more information in this sort of form? I think this sort of format obviously encourages people to be more frank. It, it is more informal. There is not the same uh, um, clash uh, on both sides of the House. And I should, just as the press as I said earlier, in my view, gets more out of the Prime Minister on those Thursday afternoon sessions if they still run 
I don't know whether they do or not, but they used to do in my day. Um, I think certainly you would achieve that. Uh, whether all members of the House would agree with it, uh, you would want everybody on the select committee, wouldn't you? That is the problem, of course. Mm. Um, Sir John. Uh, well, Canada, one of the um, alternative suggestions is revolves around the substantive question formula. And one of the ideas which has been, I think, quite widely discussed amongst backbenchers has been the idea of having the 10 balloted uh, questioners uh, then putting down their substantive question, should we say, 24 hours before the actual question time. Uh, and then having all, sub all the supplementary questions relating to that substantive question, but also to give the leader of the opposition this chance to say, give number two slot uh, to the leader of the opposition to ask one, two, or three questions of the day. Now, this suggestion has been put forward. What, what do you think of it? Do you think there's any possibility? I, I, I like that idea. That's, that is the way my mind is, is working. Put down substantive questions as late as um, is, is convenient to both uh, the backbencher and to the Prime Minister, uh, and then allow them to be followed up. Uh, and giving the, uh, the leader of the opposition some opportunity if he wishes to join in. But uh, I, I, think, um, I think he'll almost have to, you know, or she will, the leader of the opposition, because it is becoming so much, or has become uh, so much a just, I think was the phrase you used. Um, uh, and and um, uh, but I, I, I think that's inevitable, but I, I would urge that you should hold back as it were, going, uh, hold members back from going too far down that road for the reasons I've explained. Uh, but can I just follow, following that for a moment, Lord Callaghan, would you not see that the possibility of the suggestion being made by Sir John Hannon, uh, whereby the single substantive question would obviously therefore have to be, uh, have supplementaries only on that substantive question from, if it was from the opposition, uh, substantive questions on that subject from the government. Therefore, the government couldn't put in a relieving question to the Prime Minister on some entirely other subject, and you would really have four or five supplementaries on a single subject, which perhaps would be very much more enlightening, more helpful making a point from the opposition, or equally more helpful from a member of the government side being able to put forward his own particular case. Yes, I, I hope that will be the case. And you see, because uh, on what Sir John Hannon has suggested on his, uh, those ideas, um, if you could only ask supplementary questions that were broadly related to the original question, that should encourage members to put down broader questions concerned with government strategy or whatever it may be, or international affairs, uh, r rather than to put down... Uh, I won't, I, I, I won't enumerate them, I can't think of one of them. You know, the sort of uh, small question, uh, or not to put it down, but to ask it uh, as a lead-on to, to everything else. In other words, I think it could broaden the, the, whole, the whole aspect of question time if you got down to the bigger issues. Thank you. Mr. Pike, you want to... Uh, look, do we not have to be careful that we don't preclude Parliament from asking a question similar to one that I actually specifically raised following the Christmas recess when we had the Westland affair and we had the Secretary of State made a, a statement to the House at half past three. He had to come back to the House at 11 o'clock that night to make another statement because it was quite clear that his earlier statement had been incorrect. And therefore my question changed from what I'd had all conceptions of asking, having on that particular occasion had more f than four weeks to think about it, to then say, did the Prime Minister, sitting next to the Secretary of State at 3.30 the previous day, uh, was she aware that he had misled the House? Because quite clearly, the Prime Minister was responsible for Cabinet to involvement and discussions in that particular instance. And do we not have to be careful that we don't have a, a system that precludes the odd, unique situation from being raised immediately with the Prime Minister. Yes. I, I hope nothing I want to suggest should make it easier for ministers, Prime Minister or anybody else. And I think one of the ways of dealing with the point that you've raised, which is a very real one, is first of all that government should be willing to volunteer more statements. Secondly, that the PNQ should be more freely accepted. 
I think both of those have become, as I, as I judge from watching, become more constrained than they used to be. Uh, there aren't as many examples of, of, of either. And that, I think, might help to meet your problem. The third, of course, is that if you got to this kind of situation, ideal situation, I don't expect you to get to, but I would like to see, uh, th then I think um, the leader of the opposition ought to be more free in putting down his own question. And uh, this should become part of the, of the tradition, that any question from the leader of the opposition is automatically accepted. And if your kind of situation arose, it would clearly be then a matter where the leader of the opposition would come straight in. I think, I think those kind of precautions could be taken. Uh, but I do want to say one other thing, and that is one or two remarks have been made as though the Prime Minister can really do, I won't say what he likes, but he has a great deal of power. Uh, I'm sure none of you will underrate your own influence. The, any Prime Minister who is uh, serious and sensible is, is very conscious that he depends upon the House of Commons. Uh, even if, uh, even upon the opposition in the House of Commons, to get the acquiescence, if not the support of the opposition, if you want legislation to go through, if you want to achieve uh, your ends. And so I think that no Prime Minister, but at any rate, I don't think, I think uh, Prime Minister should not attempt to override the House of Commons, except in time of war or in some extreme circumstance like that. And I, I think that... Uh, it, 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 most prime ministers, I think, would regard it, would regard the House of Commons in that way. You are very conscious uh, that you uh, owe, owe your position as prime minister to the House of Commons. I think that, I doubt that that ever leaves the mind of any prime minister at the end of the day. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Lord Callaghan, members of the public have asked me at times to explain the constant use of the phrase, I refer them, honourable member, to the reply I gave some moments ago. If the House decides to retain the use of open questions, um, does the use of that phrase serve any practical uh, purpose for the Prime Minister of, of the day, or could it be dispensed with? Not the slightest, not yeah, the slightest yeah. help at all. Yeah, get yeah, straight on with the, uh, with, with, with the meat and get on, get on with it, I would say. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Adam Mackay. Well, Reverting back to your period of leader of the opposition, when you just stated to this committee that there were occasions when you chose not to ask a question, am I then right in assuming that you would actually restrict the leader of the opposition to one or two supplementaries, or would you just prefer a self-denying ordinance? No, I don't think you should place any restriction on the leader of the opposition, any more than you do on, on that of the Prime Minister. And he, he, should, uh, he, he should be free within his discretion and his judgment to uh, intervene when he thinks appropriate. That would be my right. general view. Uh, I thought I detected in uh, some of your earlier answers, Lord Callaghan, that uh, uh, from the point of view of the best use of the time uh, of the Prime Minister and his staff in preparing the day before and on the day itself, uh, it would be better if uh, Prime Minister's questions were confined to one uh, day a week instead of two, maybe for a longer period, which would help to uh, develop more serious debate perhaps. Uh, than takes place at the moment. Is, uh, was I correct in thinking that you were hinting that would be a good thing? No, I, I have quite an open mind about that. Um, obviously, I think from the Prime Minister's convenience, it would uh, help him, especially on Cabinet Day, which is Thursday, not to answer then, because then he is obviously has tremendous problems from the very first thing in the morning, uh, because Cabinet probably goes on until 12 or 1 o'clock and so on. But I don't have any particular view about that, uh, I, I, I suppose it would be easier, but on the other hand, none of us should discourage the Prime Minister from being in the House, and if answering questions twice a week is one way of getting him there, well and good. Mm -hmm. Mr Banks. Mm, thank you, Chair. My third question, Jim, I mean, it's uh, catching up on all those questions I wasn't able to ask you when you were <laughs> Prime Minister. Um, Thank you, God. You, you, <laughs> you said, um, you said uh, at the very beginning uh, that you felt that in, for example, the United States, Prime Minister's question time was viewed as a bit of a comedy show. Um, 
wasn't that a ra isn't that a rather harsh judgment of it? Um, I, I, they don't see it as a joke. I mean, people are fascinated by Prime Minister's Question Time. Can you think of any other uh, example around the world where the head of government is treated in the way that we treat the head of government in the House of Commons? And what's wrong with uh, giving the head of government a bit of a bashing around? I mean, it's a great leveller, don't you think? Well, it depends who the Prime Minister is. <laughs> Whether you give them a good bashing or not. Uh, um, what's wrong with it? Nothing's wrong with it. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, uh, in the sense that um, uh, having fierce criticism um, of the Prime Minister and of the government of the day is, of course, the duty of the opposition if they think he's wrong, but not just for the sake of it. Um, I, 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 I rather feel that... Um, uh, the bludgeon has replaced the rapier and on the whole the rapier was a rather more elegant weapon and produced results that were just as effective. Lord Callaghan, uh, we've been putting questions to you. Are there any points that we have missed that you think that um, you would like uh, to mention because we uh, can't be omnipotent in these matters and if you'd like to sum up any of your views, we'd be delighted to hear them. No, I think, well, well yes. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, however rational this committee will be at the end of the day, obviously as you yourselves recognize, it will be the House that will decide. Um, the system does work. Uh, and I, uh, I, I think that um, even if you can't make any changes, it will still be a very, a very good system. Uh, no doubt about that, and I wouldn't want Tony Banks or anybody else to think I didn't believe that. Uh, I think ever since I've been in the House uh, I've, for 50 years, there has always been dissatisfaction with question time. Question time to the Prime Minister has been altered a number of times. So clearly we're not going to get an ideal, an ideal solution. Uh, but I think that with different generations of parliamentarians, uh, fashions change and the approach alters. Uh, and uh, I, I suppose the task of this committee is to try to recommend something that will meet what members really want in the House uh, today. Uh, otherwise, they won't accept it. So you may feel that um, uh, the open question has to continue uh, and uh, until another generation comes along and they may one day say, well, we want to go back to something else or do something different. But then, you know, my experience is that History goes round in a circle, a spiral. It gradually goes up, but it goes round and round. And I'm constantly astonished at the number of things that I found and thought were self-evident, which I read in the newspapers and elsewhere, have been newly discovered and have only been reinvented. Lord Gallagher, <coughs> may we thank you very much. Yeah, you yeah, come yeah. with great charm, and uh, it is quite evident why you've been able over these years not uh, only to uh, evoke the, um, the respect uh, uh, and indeed, I think I say from all sides, the affection of us all for you as one of our most senior uh, parliamentarians and we could not be more grateful for you giving up your time to come to our committee this afternoon. Thank you very much. Gary. Carried by six votes to five. <laughs> <laughs> I hope on that point absolutely unanimous, because I don't normally allow applause at this committee. It's the first time I know it's, it's actually happened. Thank so you thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah.